In a previous video, we looked at how Newton's second law can be applied to objects in uniform circular motion. And just to remind you what uniform circular motion is, this refers to an object that is moving in a circular path at a constant speed. And this constant speed is important here. So as this object is moving in its circular orbit, it is not speeding up or slowing down. And examples would include a satellite orbiting the Earth in a perfectly circular orbit, or if you were a ball on a string around your head at a constant rate. This would be another example. And the centripetal force acting on the ball and the satellite can be described by the same formula. So the centripetal force, which is also called the radial force, is equal to the object's mass multiplied by its velocity squared divided by the radius of the circle. In this video, we're going to talk about situations when this circular motion is non-uniform. This means that the object's speed changes as it moves around the circle. And whenever something changes its speed, it's undergoing acceleration. And you may have seen this described by this equation, where delta v over delta t is equal to the acceleration. In other words, a change in velocity over a change in time provides you with the acceleration of the object of interest. An example of non-uniform circular motion would be if you're accelerating your car around a bend or a roundabout. This acceleration could be positive, which means that you're hitting the accelerator and speeding up as you're moving around the roundabout or the bend. But this acceleration could also be negative. For example, if you're going around the bend and you're slowing down by hitting the brakes. Now, centripetal force, which is also known as radial force, or you might have heard it as radial force, acting on an object moving in uniform circular motion is simple to work out. Remember, in uniform circular motion, our object speed is constant. It doesn't change. So in uniform circular motion, we only have one force acting on our object, and this centripetal force always points towards the center of the circle. And you can see this from our diagram here. We have a ball or an object, a circular object, moving in a circular orbit at a constant speed. And this force vector here, this radial or centripetal force vector, always points towards the center of the circle. When it comes to non-uniform circular motion, the object also has a tangential force acting on it. And that's because the object has an acceleration along the path of the circle. Think of a car accelerating around a roundabout. The force that the tires exert on the road makes the car accelerate. And the relationship between this force and acceleration is described by Newton's second law, where the sum of all the net external forces acting on our object of interest is equal to the object's mass multiplied by its acceleration. Now, for non-uniform circular motion, the tangential force is always at 90 degrees from the radial or centripetal force. And these two forces are acting on our object at the same time. So what is the total force acting on our object if our object is undergoing non-uniform circular motion? What would the net force be and which direction would it point? Well, forces are vector quantities, which means they both have a magnitude or size and they have a specific direction they point in. 
The total force acting on our object is the sum of these two vectors. And if you're a bit rusty on vectors, I have a playlist in the card above. But if we have a look at our vector diagram here, we have a force pointing down towards the centre of the circle, our radial force here. We also have our tangential force that points at a 90 degree angle from our radial force. Now if we know the values of the tangential and centripetal forces, we can use Pythagoras' theorem to find the magnitude of the total force. Because remember that these two forces, the tangential and the radial force, form a right-handed triangle. And the total force is the hypotenuse of this triangle. So we can use trigonometry or Pythagoras' theorem to work out this total force here. And again, I've got a playlist on vectors if you're a bit rusty on this topic. So just to clarify, the radial force is responsible for keeping the object in its circular path. If we're talking about a satellite in orbit around the Earth, this radial force comes from the force of gravity. And now the force of gravity is continually pulling at this satellite, keeping it in a circular orbit. If our object is a piece of clothing in a washing machine, for example, and the washing machine and the drum of the washing machine is spinning really fast, then the radial force is produced by the normal force pushing against the clothing from the inside surface of the drum. And if our object is a ball attached to a string, which is being whirled around in a circle, our radial force comes from the tension in the string. And it's this tension that's pulling at the ball, keeping it in a circular orbit. So let's actually do some physics with what we learnt here. So we have a small ball of mass m and it's attached to the end of a cord of length r. This ball is swung in a vertical circle about a fixed point. Our goal is to determine the tension in this cord at any instant when the speed of the ball is v and this speed will change along the ball's path because this is an example of non-uniform circular motion and this will become clearer in a minute. And we want to determine the tension when the angle theta is known with the vertical. So because we're swinging this ball in a vertical direction where the bottom of the circle here is closest to the ground and the top of the circle is furthest away, the ball's speed is not going to be uniform. And that's because the force of gravity is pulling it at our ball. If we're swinging this ball in an anti-clockwise direction, our ball will accelerate on the left-hand side of the circle. So from the top of the circle, moving towards the left, down to the bottom of the circle. But on the right-hand side, where the ball is at the bottom, moving to the top of the circle, the ball will decelerate, it will slow down as it fights gravity. So we do in fact have two forces acting on this ball here. Our tangential component of acceleration is controlled by the gravitational force acting on the ball. And remember, the tangential acceleration is the acceleration along the curved path and always acts at 90 degrees to the centripetal acceleration, where the centripetal acceleration points towards the center of the circle. If we look at our free body diagram of our ball here, we have two forces acting on our ball. One is the gravitational force, or the weight of the ball, and the second force is the tension exerted by the cord, and it's this tension here that provides our centripetal force and holds our ball in a circular orbit. With our ball's weight, we need to use trigonometry 
to convert our weight vector into a tangential component. In other words, a weight vector that points in the same direction as the ball's motion and a radial component. In other words, a weight vector that points away from the center of the circle. Now it points away from the center of the circle because this vector is influenced by the force of gravity. And we'll see this in the vector diagram in a second. So if we draw these component vectors on our free body diagram here, we get a right angled triangle here. The hypotenuse of this triangle is the weight of our ball and always points down towards the ground at an angle of theta. Now the adjacent side is always the hypotenuse, our weight here, multiplied by cosine theta. And the opposite side is the hypotenuse multiplied by sine theta. Because we're only interested in the tension in the cord, we'll only focus on the radial forces on the ball, that is, mg cosine theta, dictated by the gravitational force, and the tension introduced by the cord. From Newton's second law, we know that an object's mass, the net external force applied to the object, and the object's resultant acceleration is summed up with force equals mass times acceleration. The sum of the radial force on our ball is equal to the tension in the cord minus mg cosine theta. And here I've chosen the force directed to the center of the circle to be positive and the force is pointing away from the center as negative. So we have this equation here. But we also discovered earlier in this video and in a previous video that the centripetal force is also equal to the mass of the object multiplied by the velocity squared divided by the radius of the circle. And what we can do with these two equations is combine them together so they're both equal to one another. And we get the tension in the cord minus the radial force outward influenced by our gravitational force is equal to the centripetal force provided by the cord, keeping the object in a perfectly circular orbit. So all we do here is rearrange this equation to make the tension the subject of the formula. So all I'm doing here is adding both sides of the equation by mg cosine theta. And you'll notice here that in each term, we've got a variable that we can factor out. And this variable is the mass of the ball.